Well, welcome everyone to uh, the first of our our third year of Graeco Edipiaca lectures, and uh, today we're very fortunate to have to have Richard Hunter uh, talking uh, about uh, giving 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 his giving his paper on 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 on, co on coliams. Um, to introduce Richard is a is 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 a is a difficult thing. Uh, he's he's he, there, there's a the old cliche that uh, that he uh, that somebody needs no introduction. But in Richard's case, this is actually I think completely true. Um, he's 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 the ex well uh, emeritus uh, Regis Professor of Greek at Cambridge, and he's. He's he's uh, he's well known for his work in in Greek and and Roman literature on ancient literary criticism, ancient comedy, uh, Hellenistic poetry. Uh, he's published recently books on Hesiod and Plato and Homer, and uh, and, and and Greek inscriptional epigrams. Uh, his his scholarly output is is uh, is tremendous and influential, and he's 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 been a. a a, a great teacher and mentor to many of us, uh, some of whom are, are I think, uh, at, the, at at today's lecture. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're very, 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 very happy to to have to have you today, Richard. Um, and I think uh, if uh, if it's all right, we'll just we'll just get started. Uh, we have a we have a we have a handout. Um, which is available, I think, on the uh, on 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 the link that that Kata will be or ha probably has already put in put into the chat, and I am also going to to show uh, show Richard's handout on the screen. Um, so, Richard, please, if you uh, if if I'm if I'm not moving forward quickly enough, just just uh, sure. just please please do let me know. So, yes, Richard Hunter. Uh, with his paper, Penultimate Thoughts, Coliambic Verse in Greco-Roman Egypt and Beyond. Okay, Peter, thank you very much. I, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and um, as I say, Peter, I'll um, I'll just let you know about, about the handout. So, um, uh, and thank you, Peter, very much and your, your colleagues for this invitation. Anyway, th this paper arises from um, a, a very simple and, and obviously hardly novel observation, uh, which is that with two major exceptions, to which I'll turn at the end, there are really very few examples of Greek coliams, that is, as you all know, trimeters in which the penultimate syllable is long rather than short, um, there are very few examples of Greek coliams, with two major exceptions, which survive from the High Roman Empire and from late antiquity. And I'm going to be concerned in this paper only very tendentially with the Latin tradition. It's very striking, I think, that the number of coliambic inscriptions has not really increased significantly since the heady days of Crucius and Gerhard, well over a century ago, when the rediscovery of Herodas, Phoenix of Colophon and others led to a veritable outpouring of work on the coliambic tradition. The few imperial and late examples of both literary and inscriptional coliams uh, which which those scholars collected and which are easily accessible in the still um, important but now rather outdated and speculative text of A.D. Knox's Loeb of 1929, for all intents and purposes, that remains the modern corpus of later Coliam. Now, to begin at the end, as it were, we might say that it's hardly surprising that as quantitative verse gave way to verse marked by stress accent, a form which depended almost entirely on a quantitative effect, namely the replacement of a penultimate short syllable by a long one, that such verse died an almost natural death. Moreover, with the standardization of a stress on that penultimate syllable, a phenomenon regular, if not actually universal, in the second century AD, and observable well before that, we might almost say that, though late antique and Byzantine grammarians certainly knew what coliams were, if anyone had actually written coliams in late antiquity or Byzantium, no one would have noticed anyway, 
unless, of course, and this too will become relevant, they were especially flagged up. So um, as a whole, this is one subject where we should not look to the end. But can we put any flesh on the process by which we got there? What is the resonance of coliambic verse in the imperial period? How did it actually feel? When and where were coliams used? Now, in this paper, I want, for very obvious reasons, to focus in particular on the evidence from Greco-Roman Egypt, which is, in fact, for reasons which are also worth pondering, a significant part of all the evidence. But I want to just begin and sort of warm us up, as it were, with a couple of the very few occasional coliams from the imperial period, which are not necessarily connected with Egypt. And the first one is the one that I hope you can see on the screen, which is passage one on the handout, a poem of probably the first half of the third century after Christ, namely Diogenes Laertius's epitaph for the Stoic Aristone of Chios. Um, so there you have the Greek, um, together with Diogenes's introduction. The story goes that being bald, he had a sunstroke. He couldn't get one at the, here in Cambridge at the moment. And so he came to his end. I have composed a trifling poem upon him in limping iambics as follows. Wherefore, Aristone, when old and bald, did you let the sun roast your forehead? Thus seeking warmth more than was reasonable, you lit unwillingly upon the chill reality of death. Now, um, we might think that this poem is a rather typical example of displayed sucrotes, frigidity. Um, and that's, but that's not really my concern here, nor am I so concerned with how Aristone's alleged manner of death, his sunstroke, suited or precisely did not suit someone who believed that the telos of life was to live adiaphoros, like a good Stoic, indifferently. That is apparently someone who believed that everything between virtue and vice was equivalent. No, st stay, stay, with, stay, Peter, with number one. Um, and vice was equivalently worthless, and that nothing such as being warm was to be preferred. Aristone's indifference, in this indifference to sunstroke, was to have fatal consequences. But my concern here, rather, is with the way in which Diogenes introduces this poem. The introductory sentence, as many of you will know, is very typical of Diogenes. And we might think, given the reputation of coliams, that the identification of the meter is fulfilling the same function as Scopticon in the introduction to Diogenes' elegiac epigram on Empedocles. This is passage two. So, Peter, could you just go down a little bit? Uh, passage two, thank you. Uh, so this is the introduction to the poem on, Empe on Empedocles. Uh, there is an epigram of my own on him in my Pametros in a satirical vein, Scopticon, as follows. And that, too, is a very typical kind of introduction by Diogenes to one of his poems. Now, we know that Diogenes had a special interest in meter. He refers five times to his work, the Pametros, which he describes as a collection, quote, concerning all men of note who have died in every kind of meter and rhythm, both epigrams and lyrics, melee, unquote. Now, the nature of the collection, the Pametros, has been very much discussed, but it's clear that Diogenes imported poems from that work into his history of philosophers. Most of the surviving poems are in elegiacs, but there are also some very rare epodic combinations, including three coliams and five poems in rare astichic meters, Pherecrateans, Archibuleans, Prochilismatics, coliams, and galliambics, or six if we were to add catalectic iambic trimeters. Now, in the history of philosophy, in his history of philosophers, Diogenes identifies the meter of the first four of those stickic meters before he then cites the relevant poem. But he says nothing of the apodic meters or the galliambics, uh, and we simply don't know whether he regularly identified the meters he he cited in the Pametros. Um, we can, of course, only guess at why he chose to identify four or five 
or six rarer stickic meters. But it does, I think, but the fact that he does do that prompts the question of just how rare coleams were at this period, because in Diogenes, they are keeping some pretty arcane company and the kind of company that I think we normally wouldn't think of coleams as hanging out with. So do we have here then a marker of their scarcity at Diogenes's period and therefore of Diogenes's pride qua grammaticos in giving them a new life in his work. Lurking behind this postulated literary history, I think, is the probability that coleams were never, in fact, in the popular bloodstream of Greek metrical practice. They were essentially a learned reinvention in the Hellenistic period and always remained something of an oddity, marked, marked always as poetic, however low we might think their inventor Hipponax was. I shall return to, the, to how their history might make them very different in flavor at any period from Hellenistic reinventions, such as some of the other rare forms we find uh, in, in, for example, in, in Supplementum Hellenisticum, or we might think, for example, of the limping trochaic tetrameters catalectic of the recently published Tusseldomos poem from Turkey. But we must always keep in mind the company that they keep in Diogenes and the fact that they perhaps need to be thought of in this rather more rarefied atmosphere than as the way I think we tend normally to think of limping iambics. Notice also that when Diogenes um, says of his poem, Prose Paisamen, we, I made a joke, uh, he's clearly also treating coliams there as belonging to a literary and metrical pygneon. Now, some of the considerations that I've raised with regard to the poem by Diogenes uh, apply also perhaps to others of the very few extant, what we might call literary coleams or occasional coleams from the imperial period. Now, Peter, can you go down to number three? Yeah, a bit further to get the translation in. Okay. Now, number three um, is a poem um, from the uh, the new history, the kind of historia of Ptolemaeus Kenos, who will be known to many of you, a, a, a kind of a miscellanist whom you wouldn't trust as far as you could throw him from the late first or early second century AD. Uh, and what we know about his work is largely dependent on a summary in Photius. And Photius includes what I've given you here as number three. This is um, a, an anecdote concerning one Carinos, uh, an iambic poet of the first century before Christ, and his relations with the rock of Lefkas, from which unhappy lovers cast themselves in the hope of a cure. So the iambic poet Carinus fell in love with the eunuch Eros. So he fell in love with love, just, to, just like um, Psyche in Apuleius' story. He fell in love with the eunuch Eros, the wine steward of Eupator. This is Mithridates Eupator, who reigned from 120 to 63 before Christ. Believing the story about the rock, he threw himself down. He broke his leg, and as he was dying from the pain, he threw out the following iambics. Deceitful, evil rock of Lefkas, to hell with you. You have burned Carinos, the muse of Iambos, to ashes with empty stories offering hope. May Eupator feel such a love for Eros. Now, this poem, like the anecdote with the almost too good to be true name of the eunuch Eros, very likely belongs to Ptolemaeus himself, not to anybody else. Although in their edition of this poem, Parsons and Lloyd-Jones must in principle be correct that the verses could in fact date from Eupatol's own lifetime. Be that as it may, the self-consciousness of the reference to the muse of Iambos is matched by Carinus's broken leg. Now the broken leg is very obviously a dramatization which prepares for the coliams, the limping iambics, which Carinus is about to utter. Just as Demetrius in his treatise on style reports that Hipponax shattered Ethrause, the iambic meter 
to create a limping and unrhythmical verse form, which was, in, Demo in Demetrius's words, suitable for abuse. Here too, then, verses in Coliams call attention to themselves. But there may also be more. If ever there was a character in Greek literature whom one might have expected to be associated with Coliams, it is surely Thersites, both Ametropes, a uh, speaker without measure, and Coloss, lame, in one foot. Gregory Nage met, famously made Thersites the embodiment of blame poetry, but, but perhaps he should really have said lame poetry, except for the fact that the ugliest Greek at Troy does not in fact ever seem to be associated, somewhat surprisingly, with Coliams in the ancient tradition. The, Iliad, the Iliadic Scolia do, however, report a story from Pherecydes that before the Trojan War, Thersites was among those on the Caledonian boar hunt. But then when he did not wish to join in the battle with the boar, Meliaga threw him over a cliff or he fell over a cliff while being pursued by Meliaga. And that is why he was so physically deformed. So the temptation to see this story of Thersites as punishment by Meliaga as an etiology of ugly or perhaps lame poetry should pos probably be resisted. We know that Hipponax seems to have set a different foundational story about the origins of the Coliam on a beach. And the exegetical scolia famously take Homer's description of Thersites as showing that Homer, not Xenophanes, was the first inventor of siloi, a term which, as far as we know, seems only to have been applied to hexameters. It is, however, in keeping with all that we know of coliambic and such abusive poetry generally, that Thersites should be both the victim and the perpetrator of such verses. So I suggest, perhaps simply because somebody has to do it, that Ptolemaeus's story of Carinus's leap off the rock of Lefkas replays a story associated with the invention of blame or lame poetry, and perhaps specifically of Coliams. Now, however that may be, it's worth recalling two other figures often associated in ancient and modern times with the Cites, namely the lame god Hephaestus and another famously ugly speaker of truth, Aesop. Now, Aesop might again seem a perfect vehicle for Coliams, but again, as far as I can see, the cupboard is bare. And I don't think I can be the only person to be surprised that there are no coliams extant in any version of the life of Aesop. That too seems to me to be a silence deserving of explanation. As also perhaps is the fact that the Greek magical papyri seem to be a coliam free zone, though iambic trimeters abound in those papyri. So what are we going to do with that? And of course, those papyri are importantly Egyptian. As for Hephaestus, whom one would have liked to make the patron god of Coliams, I know of only one probable instance where he might be associated with that meter. Unless, and I think this is a very, very long shot, his laughter making appearance at the end of Iliad 1 and Thetis's visit to his house in Iliad 18 have something to do with Herodas's first programmatic nimiam in which Gillis visits Met Metrike. In the first book of the Alexander Romance, and I'll come back later to the Alexander Romance, the Egyptians receive an oracle about the disappearance of Nectanebo. In the A version, the oldest version of the romance, and again, I'll come back to this, the oracle comes to the Egyptians from Hephaestus, the ancestor of the gods, that is, a, a Greecizing of the Egyptian god Ptah. Now, behind the prose in which that oracle is reported in the A version, a poem solely or predominantly in Coliams has long been detected, even by the very cautious Wilhelm Kroll. Now, I don't want to pursue that matter in great detail uh, here. And as I said, I'll come back to the Alexander romance towards the end. But any, any possible association 
between the limping god and the limping meter, I think does deserve notice. Moreover, one of the very few notices apparently about polyambic poetry from the Byzantine period may or may not, may or may not be relevant here. In the ninth century, Photius and also a Platonic scolium, which perhaps derives from Photius or vice versa, report that when the various sibyls uttered their oracles, they were out of their minds, they didn't know what they were saying, and the speed with which their words pour poured forth meant that those whose task it was to write down what they said simply couldn't keep up, with the result that, quote, many of the oracles collapsed into coliams and could no longer be corrected, unquote, as the sibyls, when they recovered their sanity, had no memory of what they had said. Now, whether a genuine tradition of coliambic oracular poetry lies behind that account, uh, an account which would then be a kind of post factum etiology for such a phenomenon, or whether we have here in that story some, dis some distorted descendant of Plutarch's discussion of the unhappy metrics in which, which oracles in verse displayed. Remember that the Greek words kolos, lame, and lameness, kolotes, can refer not just to what we call coliambics, but are also used, for example, of hexameters, which are deficient in some way, whether they are a kephalos or mouse-tailed or something in between. The metricians would still call those words kolos. Okay, so that's um, two, if you like, two of our main pieces of ev evidence for which there is not much for what we'll call literary occasional coliams in the imperial period. Uh, I'm skipping over various other surviving um, poems, but if anybody would like to pursue the, pursue the rest of the corpus, we can, of course, uh, deal with that in question time. So let me now turn to Egypt. Um, so Peter, could you go down to number four, please? Right, okay. Um, there are a few instances of coliams mixed up with pure trimeters among the inscriptions uh, on the Colossus of Memnon. But the only case, which is the one you're looking at here, passage four, uh, on the Colossus of Memnon, we, we might plausibly think of a coliambic poem, is passage, is this um, distich um, poem 22 from the Colossus. I, Pardalus of Sardis, heard Memnon twice, I will remember you also in my books. Now that, of course, is very little to go on, but we might note the, uh, the Ionic dialect, uh, appropriate perhaps to Coliams, and also Pardalus's reference to his books. If he was even just a self-styled man of learning, then he may have chosen Coliams here and Coliambic, i.e. Ionic dialect, as a learned meter, learned for want of a, of a better term here. And we've already seen that, I think, in Diogenes Laertius, and, and, um, and we, we shall see it again. But Peter, if you could go down to passage five, um, now, passage five is quite long, and so um, if you have the hand, you might also want to look at the handout rather than the screen here to get the English uh, as well as the Greek. Um, what you have as passage five here is what we might call the jewel in the crown of inscriptional coliams. This is GVI 1935 or number 71 in Bernard's collection. Uh, it's comes almost certainly from Alexandria, and it is a 28 verse epitaph for a young man. And as you'll see um, from um, the handout or the screen, uh, the first part of the poem is damaged on the left hand side, but it, uh, the second half of the poem is pretty complete. So I'll just go through it quickly, and you can pick it up in the Greek. Uh, your step, if you wish to know, the stone pillar, etc. An excellent young man among mortals, or perhaps among the dead, the phytoi. He's left the light of the sun, not yet having completed something of years, 18, alone of men, uh, God-worshipping, humane, of your comrades, um, lament your fate, 
The crowd of servants weeps for you. You were an authoritative figure, so you seemed a boy with the intelligence of an older man. And then from this point on, we pick up almost from line 13, a complete text. Much missed mother, put an end to your lamentation. Uh, the nurse of grief, which causes you pain to no purpose. No one escapes the thread of the Moirai. No mortal, no immortal, not the prisoner, not even the tyrant with his kingly power has ever thought to flee from the laws which cannot be changed. Did not Titan weep for Phaethon when he fell out of the chariot from heaven to earth? Did not Hermes, the son of Maia, weep for his son Myrtilos, carried away by the waves out of his chariot? Did not Thetis grieve for her mighty son when he was killed by the arrows of Apollo? Did not the lord of all men and gods weep for Sarpedon? Did he not lament? Did not the Macedonian King Alexander, the son of Ammon, who took the form of a snake, to forget him? So not forget, baguette. Not a word I use every day, so I had sort of forgotten it. Um, so that's Benon 71. Now, um, you will have instantly noticed, of course, that within all of these coliams, there is a scattering of pure trimeters, verses 3, 22, and 25. Um, we might think that very unsurprising in a poem of this length. You will also be unsurprised by the fact that all of those pure trimeters have been amended away by modern scholars. That's what they do when they have nothing else to do. Now, um, one question um, that arises and will arise again about um, about this mix is whether such a metrical mixture, if that's what we want to call it, um, is simply uh, an accident. Does it belong? Does it belong with an inscriptional tradition of verse? I mean, as you're from, as you're aware, very often in inscriptions you get, for example, if it looks like elegiacs. You might get three hexameters and then a pentameter. You get something which looks to us irregular. Whereas what we have with literary verse is completely regular in that sense? Or uh, does it belong independently in a kind of iambo-coliambic tradition? After all, um, the mixture of coliams and pure trimeters was found already in Hipponax, although it doesn't seem to have been repeated in Hipponax's Hellenistic imitators. Um, so, but it's one thing which sets this poem, and as we'll see, other poems as, apart from what we'll call, what I will, might call the literary tradition, and on and on the side of the literary tradition, not the side, as you like, of the uh, non-literary inscription tradition, stands the most famous um, coliambist of them all in the imperial period, Babrius, to whom we'll get, uh, if time allows, um, at the very end. Now, go, Peter, can you go up, back up into the Greek a bit? Um, back, yeah, thank you, yeah. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Um, in his edition, Werner Paik set off verses 13 following. You, you can see the verse that's broken at the beginning, but then it says, pothe te meter, uh, mi much missed mother. Paik set those um, verses off as a separate unit, presumably on the basis of the change of voicing in the poem at that point. But such changes of voice are in fact extremely common in verse epitaphs. And anyway, one might think that the matter of versing in the of voicing in the poem is not actually really clear. In verses one to eight, the life and virtues of the deceased are narrated by an epitaphic speaking voice, which some would identify with the tomb itself, and that is all in the third person. And then in verses 9 to 12, the deceased is addressed in the second person. Now, in his edition, Bannon takes those verses to be spoken by the deceased surviving mother. But nothing in them, I think, apart from Pothete Mete in verse 13, supports that contention. And they certainly, those verses, 9 to 12 at least, seem to me at least to lack the emotional quality which one might expect from the grieving mother. And Semnos in line 11 does not seem to me a very maternal word. <laughs> 
better, I think, then to take the verses as continuing the, epi the anonymous epitaphic voice. Bernon and also Peak take verses 13 to the, uh, to the end to be addressed by the deceased to his grieving mother. And that, of course, would be very common in an epitaphic situation. And so that may be right. If so, then the display of learning in the poem, in the second half of the poem, will be in character. That is, it will be an illustration of the young man's wisdom beyond years, which is lauded in verse 12. I have, however, wondered whether the poem as a whole might be in the anonymous epitaphic voice, in which case the address to Pothete Meter will mean much missed mother of the deceased rather than much missed mother of mine. But we can pursue that if we wish to uh, in question time. Now, the date of this poem has always been very much disputed. It's been assigned to each of the first three Christian centuries and to an even earlier period. But it seems to me that the only real argument in favor of a late Hellenistic rather than an imperial date has been the absence of consistent paroxytonesis. I can I barely say the word. That is um, the idea that the penultimate syllable in the line uh, always carries uh, an accent stress. Uh, and, and it seems to me that that's a very fragile assumption, uh, a very fragile argument of, on which to date this poem. For one thing, it assumes, uh, if you like, a chronologically even consistent spread of paratoxinesis throughout um, the late um, pre-imperial and imperial period. And I'll come back to that. The further Babrian habit of uh, in Coliams of always having a naturally long final syllable is also not observed in this poem. And again, we'll come back to that. Um, now, there are touches in this poem. There are very clear touches of high or poetic style, but nothing, I think, that seems to demand a particular chronology. Now, I don't have time here um, for anything, but we'll be happy to pursue it, of course, in question time. I don't have time for anything like uh, a full discussion of this poem and its problems. Uh, among the problems which people have debated at length is whether or not the poem is complete or is, some, is for example, is something missing at the end? I mean, was there a, was there a verb? Uh, uh, with line 27 and so forth. But it seems to me pretty clear that the, uh, the one thing which is clear about the poem is its scale and its ambition. Um, the mythology um, of the poem uh, is very striking. The mythology through which the consolation to the deceased mother is expressed. And it clearly marks this. It's not just the length of this poem, it's also the nature of this poem, which marks this out as really a very special epitaph. And some sections of the poem might suggest to us the interests and outlook precisely of the grammaticos. Now we have in um, uh, verses uh, 21 following, um, we have, did not Hermes weep for his son Myrtilus when he was cast out on the waves from the chariot? Now, there we have the story of Myrtilus thrown by Pelops out of the, uh, out of the chariot in which they were both traveling as it sped across the waves. Now, that story is unsurprisingly evoked on a number of occasions in tragedy. And I think that verse 22 might, in fact, excuse me, be a kind of quasi-echo of the tragic genre, despite the awkwardness in that verse of the versification. Now, in some versions, Myrtilus's mother was a daughter of Danaos called Phaethusa. And if, if that's what we're supposed to think of, then we have a link of a kind which would appeal very much to the grammaticos from Phaethon in verse 19 through to the son of Phaethusa in the next example. Uh, that's the kind of hidden link between successive examples in poetry, which, which very much appeals to a particular kind of learning. That the death of Sarpedon in verses 25 to 26, a death for which Zeus had to weep, 
illustrates the fact that gods, including Zeus himself, are subject to the laws of fate, is, of course, a story which is thematized in the Iliad itself, book 16. And Peter, if you could go down now to passage 6. Yeah, there I've given you in passage six uh, a couple of extracts from the scholia on the Sarpedon story in Iliad 16, and you'll see that the exegetical scholia draw precisely the same lesson as does our coliambic poet. So either Zeus's lamentation is instructive, it's pi difti k, as the poet is teaching us that gods too put up with what is fated. Therefore, men should bear the, the events of fate nobly. Or again, the poet is offering us the instructive lesson that we must put up with painful events, since even Zeus, the best of gods, does so. And that's precisely what the, uh, the Alexandrian poem says. Now, none of those considerations, of course, is anything like probative. But there does seem to me to be a cumulative case for regarding the Alexandrian epitaph as a very high composition. And I think that the coliambic meter here, too, is a mark of ambition, something which sets the poetic level of the poem uh, uh, very high and certainly marks it against one of the mill trimeters or elegiacs. Now, the upshot of that brief survey is that what survives of coliams from the imperial period perhaps carry two resonances or flavors. On the one hand, something does survive of the rhythm's association with uh, the low or the simple life. Um, on the other, the meter can be marked as learned, as raising the poetic level above the ordinary. And in some ways, of course, those two flavors already coexisted in the Hellenistic coliams of Callimachus, Herodas, and others. Imperial poetry always picks and chooses what it needs from a rich tradition. And I think we can see both of those flavors at work uh, in, an, in another um, Greco-Egyptian set, set, uh, set of coliams, passage seven. Uh, on your handout. And the, I'm, I apologize that I haven't given a translation for this. This is partly uh, simply because the text is very difficult, but I'll, I'll pick out what, what's important in it. Now, these seven coliams are included in a remarkable and very truly Greco-Egyptian honorific monument, which is Bernard number 114, now in the Museum of Cairo. And this is a monument, which I'm sure many of you know, it's in honor of one Ptolemagrios, who was presumably, uh, who was apparently, excuse me, a benefactor of both the temples of the gods and of his fellow citizens in Panopolis. In Panopolis. And Ptolemagrios may well also be the poet of some at least of the verses on this monument. The date of the monument may be Augustan, but some would date it very considerably later. Now, as many of you will know, what, ha what, what we have on, on this monument for Ptolemagrios, uh, uh, from a textual point of view, are not just coliams, but also hexameters, uh, different sections in hexameters, and also in elegiacs. But as you can see, the subject of the coliams is the simple philosophical and pious life claimed to the extraordinary astonishment of modern interpreters by Ptolemagrios and his family alongside what appear to be public benefactions. So you can see there um, in the second half, um, uh, this is a presentation uh, of the life of Agrios and his children. Then, uh, then verses two and three are very disputed, but they seem to be um, referring to um, the estate and uh, possibly the so the animals on his estate. Um, uh, the pious works from which they live f very philosophically, ponoisi pantoioisi lita praesontes, doing simple things through great ponos, without wealth and um, envy, which brings spite or whatever. Now, the peaceful fruit orchard of that poem, created by honest labor of Ptolemagrios and his sons, serves as something of a metaphor for the simple and peaceful life that they lead. 
And it's tempting to think then that the coliams of the poem are well suited to that publicly displayed message. I have to say that the quite substantial modern scholarship on this monument has shown, as far as I can see, no interest whatsoever in the possible reasons for the choice of coliams. Now, as I've said, the text of the coliams is difficult and there are many uncertainties. But what we can say is that the hexameters with which the coliams are associated on this monument contain wholesale quotations from, from Homer together with other allusions to Homer and reworkings of high, high style Homeric language. There is nothing low about the ambition of this very proud monument. If, and particularly here note the word lita in the penultimate verse there, if the coliams are chosen there for their almost cynic associations with simplicity and the rejection of, of pretension, a familiar Hellenistic coliambic mode of which our panop panopolitan verses might be a last fading echo, then the coliams also contribute to the high manner of the monument and its poetry. And so the two resonances sit very comfortably together. Okay, Peter, could you go down, please, now? Yeah, okay, that's fine, Peter, that's fine. Okay, so now I've left to last um, the two largest bodies of coliambic poetry, which may or may not be relevant to a consideration here. Now, the first uh, of these two um, large bodies of material are the coliambic parts of the alpha version of the Alexander Romance, which is preserved uniquely in manuscript A of the 11th century. And as many of you will know, that version is very clearly the oldest version. And the basic shape of that version of the Romance, I think most, though not all students, would date to the late third century after Christ. However, many elements of the narrative go back to Hellenistic sources, some perhaps almost contemporary with Alexander himself. And most modern scholars would identify Alexandria and Egypt as the place of origin of the core of the Alpha version. It, of course, contains the famous story of Nectanebo. Now, how extensive should be the restoration of coliams in what is a difficult and corrupt text remains a very disputed subject over which almost no two editors agree. But there can, I think, be no real doubt at all that there were at some point, but the key question is when, significant stretches of coliambic verse in the Alexander Romance, and that it covered both narrative in the voice of the narrator and also direct speech by the characters. The Latin version of the Alexander Romance by Julius Valerius from the fourth century AD, which like the, also like the famous fifth century Armenian version, clearly belongs to the alpha narrative, not to any other version. Um, that too uh, has hexameters, a passage of Latin scenarii, i.e. trimeters, with, uh, which correspond to trimeters in the Greek. But there is also one passage of Latin coliams, where, uh, which is a prayer by Alexander to Achilles at the site of Troy. And that occurs in a section where the manuscript alpha, that is the Greek version, has a major lacuna, uh, and editors assume that there must have been a corresponding Greek poem, presumably in coliams at that point. Now, the origin, or perhaps we should say origins, of the coliams in the Alexander Romance is, of course, very disputed. Was this version of the Alexander Romance conceived from the beginning as a kind of prosimetrum? Or are we dealing with insertions into a prose text, a prose text which was in any case compilatory in nature? Along with such uncertainty goes, of course, the question of date, which has particular significance uh, in this matter. Now, Richard Stoneman, for example, uh, who's done so much for, for the study of the Alexander Romance, he regarded the Coliams as in essence Hellenistic, uh, 
And he's in fact tempted, as others have been before him, by the idea that a good part of what we let's call it an original version of the Alexander Amounts was actually written in Coliams. I mean, whether or not you can talk about an, an original Alexander Amounts is, of course, a disputed question. So that they would, in fact, go all the way back to the Hellenistic period. Um, most scholars, however, would, I think, see an imperial date for the Coliams and the Romance, not least on the grounds of versification. Um, when the Alexander Romance clearly has trimeters, they're not consistently paroxetone, though, that, though I think one can argue, and I, I obviously don't have the, the time or this is not the place for a full proof of that, they do have a tendency in that direction. The coliams, uh, I think, are more consistently peroxetone, if not quite perfectly. Um, there's no obedience in the Alexander amount to Babrius's choice of a naturally final long syllable. Peter Fraser, who seems to favor an early origin for these verses, regards the use of the coliam and the romance as a sign that the verses, quote, probably have a very humble origin in popular recitations, unquote, and are, quote, the efforts of a lower order of poets, unquote. In fact, however, as we have seen, the evidence for the coliam as a humble meter of the people is very thin on the ground indeed. The idea of the coliam as low seems in fact itself to be a Hellenistic learned construction of the low, deriving in part from Hipponax's subject matter. And though opinions can no doubt differ, it is at least not obvious to me that the restricted number of coliambic verses which are accepted by virtually all students of the Alexander Romance are either innately humble or of a low order if they don't strike us as sophisticated as, say, Callimachus's coliams, well, I don't think many would actually pass that test. Um, the longest passage for which, about which we can be absolutely certain is a more than 140 verse poem on the almost literally tragic destruction of Thebes. And this is a poem which revels in its display of the history and mythology of the city and in reworkings of and allusions to classical literature. Now, what I put on the handout, which you can't, all of which you, you can't see on, on, on the screen, but I, if you have the handout, you can. I've just given you two extracts um, from this poem to give you something of the flavor of this poem and to encourage a discussion afterwards. The text I put this is the the text from Kroll's edition. There have been changes suggested to it, but but nothing really significant for present purposes. So you'll see the first extract there. Um, this this is a, a Theban pleading with Alexander not to destroy the city, and um, the way the rhetoric of the plea is to is to rehearse the mythology and history of Thebes, and to argue that Alexander himself is actually by descent a Theban, and therefore he shouldn't destroy his own city. So you can see there in the first passage, it begins with a reference to um, um, the, the Ismenos, the river coming from Kithiron, which brings back it water. And then you can see virtually in the third, from the third to um, the sixth verse, what is essentially a summary of the plot of Euripides' Bacchae. Um, uh, and then we get more Theban mythology, the Durke, and of course, we finish the passage with um, with Oedipus and the Sphinx. And the whole passage is uh, replete with a direct allusion to virtually citation from uh, Attic tragedy. And then in the, the second passage I've given you there um, is uh, Alexander replying um, in anger to the plea, as you can see, um, the Macedonian turned his eye upon him, gnashed his teeth, and in breathing out anger, he said, oh, you dreadful Theban, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that will give you some, some of the flavor of what's going on. Now, if um, the mythology uh, in this poem is not perhaps as, as Scott a non as, say, Lycophron's Alexandra, I think there's no doubt that we're dealing with a poem of some considerable ambition. 
And it's a poem which, uh, if I can add a footnote, it deserves to be much better known by classicists who aren't fully signed up Alexander Amant's people, which is almost saying virtually everybody. Um, the poem too, as you will have noted, also contains a scattering of pure trimeters. Um, it's perhaps worth adding that the one, pass the one passage in Coliams in the Latin version of Julius Valerius is also very rich in mythological and poetic allusion, not, and I, this might be tendentious, but I don't think so, not entirely unlike the epitaph from Egypt um, that we've looked at. As a footnote to this, let me confess that I have idly wondered from time to time whether one, if not in fact the, pr the principal reason for the use of coliams rather than trimeters in the Alexander Romans, is not or not so much that it is indeed a marked and highish form that, as that it allows the name Alexandros to be used in more places in the verse. As it happens, the name turns up some 19 times in the Coliams accepted in the latest uh, collection and edition, Bergson's edition of the poems from 1989, and it always appears at the end of the verse. The only occasion when the name is verse internal is in a corrupt but otherwise pure trimeter. Now, those figures seem to me to speak for themselves. And you'll have noticed that Alexandros also appears at the end of the verse in the Alexandrian epitaph. If there's anything to this, it's another reason, I think, to be cautious about the inference that the use of coliams in the Alexander romance is of itself a sign of their lowness or their humbleness. But the Coliambic verse of the Alexander Romance, I think, deserves our attention for other reasons, too. It poses a very interesting set of problems. For one thing, the Coliams sharply challenge the security of our sense of literary history and chronology. How can we, in fact, distinguish Hellenistic from imperial verse? And what kind of a guide do features such as par paroxytonesis actually offer? If it's true that the Alexander Romance was originally a prosy metrum in which narrative could be conducted through verse and the verse was not merely ornamental or il illustrative, how will that change our view of the history of that particular form? Above all, why coliams in such a prosy metrum? So and let me then close with, with just, uh, as it were, a, a little footnote about Babrius. So, Peter, if you could go down to the la I think what, to what I think is the last passage, passage nine. Thank you. Yeah. Now, Babrius's fables raise a very different set of issues. Babrius clearly looks self-consciously to a learned Hellenistic tradition of coliams, and it's not. I mean, the standard thing to say about Babrius is that he drew his inspiration from Callimachus's coliambic iamboi, in which fable, Babrius's subject matter, also played a very significant role. But it's also, also worth remembering the strength of Hipponax's Nachleben throughout antiquity, and several papyri show Hipponax being read and studied in Egypt throughout the High Empire. Now, Babrius's adoption of nearly complete uh, paroxytonesis, as for example, you can see on the, um, um, the, the few verses there in your passage nine, that has traditionally been seen as an inheritance from Latin, notably from Marshall. And conclusions have been drawn from this about Babrius's date and poetic context. Maria Luzzato, however, has argued that both of Babrius's most significant rhythmical choices, namely paroxytonesis, the, the stress on the uh, accent on the penultimate syllable, and also a naturally long final syllable, which is not the case with Hipponax or Callimachus or whatever, are rather to be explained as an experimentation explicable against a purely Greek metrical and rhetorical context in the second century AD. 
And a further question to what a further old question still needs our attention, which is to what extent a straight line leads from those developments to the stressed Byzantine 12 syllable verse. Uh, that's another old question which simply hasn't disappeared. Now, what is clear, however, I think, is that the systematic consistency of Babrian verse, that is, no pure trimeters. Um, Every every verse the same with paroxytonesis and a naturally long final syllable. Um, that systematic consistency marks Babrius's work as, for want of a better term, literary. And I'm well aware how complicated that phrase is. And it makes it, I think, a different proposition from the coliams of the Alexander Romance. They seem, I think, to belong to different poetic traditions. But again, I'd be very happy to discuss this. Now, in passage nine on your handout, which comes from the preface of um, uh, the second book, um, Babrius claims to have spawned a school of imitators. I was the first to open this door, but when I had done so, others entered in who published poems resembling the riddles of a more learned views, skilled in nothing more than imitating my example. But I tell my fables in a transparent style, a lefke racis. I do not sharpen the teeth of the iams, but I test them and refine them, as it were, in the fire, and I am careful to soften their sting. Such is this second book, which I compose for you. Now, Babrius there claims to have spawned a school of imitators, uh, whom, very interestingly, he charges with writing more learned riddle-like poems. And we might wonder whether that is some kind of hit at latter day Kalimachians. Now, it is in fact very difficult, I think, to find evidence for Greek coliambic fables trailing in his wake. What scanty material we have for imperial fables in Greek other than Babrius is predominantly in hexameters or in pure iambics. But it must be stressed that the evidence really is thin on the ground. And it's hardly to be doubted that there were imitators whose work can perhaps be traced through later fables. In, in probably the early 5th century AD, Avianus ad adapted Babrius's fables and perhaps also fables of others into Latin elegiacs, and he explicitly drew attention to the metrical change in, the, in his prose preface. And if he's translating um, poems, which were uh, po poets other than Babrius, that's, that might be clear evidence for post-Babrian coliambic fable. And we know from the evidence of the papyri and the complex later manuscript uh, tradition uh, that Babrius's fables circulated really quite widely in later antiquity. But what I what uh, what I'm what I would would like to suggest is that in some ways Babrius knee in considering the 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 spread and fate and so forth of of coliambic verse in the empire at one level we actually need to set babrius on one side because he in some ways is is a, a rather different phenomenon than the poems that i've been pursuing uh, today and it's more than time uh, i came to that laying conclusion thank you Thank you very much, Richard. Um, it was a very, a very, a very, a very, very, very interesting, very interesting paper, and I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure, I'm sure people have a, uh, a lot of questions to ask. I, um, uh, while they're collecting themselves, I suppose I just wanted to, um, to really to, to ask your thoughts on two points. The, the first is the first is 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 Hipponax himself, and. You know, in re in, re in recent years, I guess we've we've gone from thinking about Hipponax as a kind of as a kind of street theater of the sixth century Ionian cities to being to being a sort of to being a book, a kind of proto novel that people people read. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I I so do you think uh, Coliams are are always in that sense a learned meter? Uh, and the second question was if you could 
if you wanted to go into your that clarification of the point you made towards the end about about we us dealing with two completely different traditions of of, of coliambic verse, I, I I thought people might be grateful for that. Right. Okay. Well, on on the first point, I think um, I suppose you know we have to say that yes, from the point of view of how the ancients themselves would view the matter. Um, Hipponax's coliams were always, if you like, they didn't descend. I mean, you one way of putting it, I suppose, would be to say that unlike the trimeter, they didn't descend from heaven. Um, they are a uh, a diversion from um, the trimeter. Um, and so to that extent, because they have you and that's why, you know, they have they have an etiology, which, um, you know, we think we can uh, can be reconstructed. Uh, and as I suggested, you know, there may have been more than one etiology for their invention floating around um, uh, in antiquity. So to that extent, they're always, if you like, uh, uh, an invention. They have a, a first inventor. And to that, if if that's what, and they were then, if you like, reinvented to some extent in the Hellenistic period. So yes, I think to that extent they always are a, a, a kind of learned, um, you know, uh, made thing. And I think that's probably well. I don't know. I mean, you know, would know much more about Hipponax than I do. But my guess is that that's probably to some extent not dependent on how. For example, the Alexandrians read Hipponax's poetry, whether they read it as a series of abusive verses or, as you said, as a kind of proto-novel. On the, the the second um the second question, yeah, I'm sorry if I didn't make myself clear. Um, the background to this is uh, you know is you know something which is very often observed, and that is that um, inscriptional verse in particular, but not just inscriptional verse but one of the one of the things which separates inscriptional verse from uh, the majority of verse which um survives to us you know from by big names and in, in manuscripts or or papyri on the whole although you know i'm cutting leaving out all the footnotes is that inscriptional verse is often in many ways uh irregular that is that, as as a, you know, as I mentioned in the example I gave, you know, you you very often, for example, find, um, you know, uh, an, an uneven, you know, when when somebody's writing elegiacs, you very often find an uneven number of hexameters before the pentameter or whatever. Now you never find that in Theognis or Callimachus, or, you know, any of, you know, the quote-unquote literary poets writing elegiacs. And, you know, you and there are similar things going on with, um, uh, and of course, uh, with, with iambics um, and, and, and poetic mixtures. So what I was wondering, what I've been wondering is whether um, when we find um, a, a coliambic tradition which ha which admits from time to time mixture which admits an admixture of pure trimeters um is this as it were what we might expect in a, in this kind of inscriptional um which I, although it's not just inscriptional tradition whereas what's really striking when you set that against babrius is that babrius never does that you know, every verse is the same, like, you know, however much Theognis we could find, you would never expect there to be two hexameters before the pentameter. It's always utterly regular. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on the, now, we know, of course, that grammarians were interested in what they, you know, would think of as deficient hexameters in Homer. I mean, whether they were mouse tailed or a cephalus or whatever, uh, and you know, and that may that may perhaps it's, uh, that has to be taken into account. But uh, but uh, so I wasn't talking. I'm not talking about two utterly separate worlds. But I think there are two traditions here, um, and so that you know we would, and that's why I think um, uh, I do think that. Um, Babrius does, to some extent, represent, uh, you know, at least a different direction than some of the other poems that I was giving more attention to. Um, and I mean, similarly, of course, um, uh, as, as I think I noted, um, you know, Callimachus, 
in what we know of his coliams, I mean the first five and the last, you know, and the, and, um, the last iambic, um, Climacus too never allows uh, a pure trimeter. He too, and you know, and if you if you take that as a mark, was was one of the markers of what I've been calling, for want of a better term, literary verse. Um, then you know that they clearly are standing on that side, where some of the other poems I've been considering, like the um, the Alexandrian epitaph, and like the um, the coliams in the Alexander romance, stand on the other side of that line. Thank you, thank you. That 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 was that that, that was great. Um, yeah. Do we have any? And does do we have any any questions or comments from 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 our audience? Well, I'll go back and find some more poems. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I should say that you know there are there are, there are I'm, I'm actually in fact I will mention one thing is one thing I didn't mention simply because it's not necessarily straightforwardly Egyptian is that you know there are two or three poems uh, in Coliams which are associated with the um, uh, oracle of Apollo at Didyma, um, and suggestive of a kind of um, I mean, I you know, I, I I could have talked about this under under the the heading of sort of 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 coliams and prophecy, um, but it does seem to have been a didyma. There does seem to have been something of a kind of house style, where one might you know of um, uh, of coliambic poetry. Curiously enough, um, and it, it's sort of curious that. Um, Connected to the oracle, or? That, that, that the 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 you know the as you call it, the mythology of Apollo at Didyma is yeah. connected with Brancos, and okay. course, curiously enough, Brancos is the name of the addressee of Babrius. Oh, now, wow. uh, is that just a complete accident? Um, no yeah. one to discuss it, but I mean, mm. is it just a complete coincidence? Maybe I don't know. Mm. It's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a, a, a comment from Enrico Emanuela Prodi. Uh, hello. Um, Hi. Hi. Just, um, just to bring it back to your um, to your um, earlier comment about uh, about metrical yeah. um, irregularity, uh, if we throw Hipponax back into the mix he does what he does best i.e confuse things even further because of course in in hipponax's own coliambics there are trimeters mixed in yeah yeah so indeed. you might argue that interspersing trimeters with the coliambics is not like uh, uh quote unquote incompetent but it's in fact canonical for the coliambic and yeah. maybe the avoidance of the iambic trimeters could be Babrius ironing out yet another thing that uh, that might come across as uncouth and regularizing the coliambic into this very repetitive, very regular, um, yeah. uh, very regular um, pattern. Oh no! Yeah, no. Thank you very much, Enrique. You know, I mean, I think I, I think I said at one point that you know because we find this in Hipponax, but not in Callimachus, etc. But because it's already in Hipponax, then in a sense, you know, you can make a choice between is this part of you know the, that phenomenon? Was that phenomenon part of, as it were, the kind of untidiness of inscriptional verse or whatever, or was it as you as you, you've suggested there again, or was it belonging to a very specific iambo coliambic tradition um that was as you said there from the beginning but then was then ironed, ironed out in the interests of literariness by Callimachus um and then again by Babrius so yes I mean the fact that it's there already in Hipponax is um extremely interesting and of course you know as a um as as you know very well as I mentioned at the end we you know there's lots of evidence that Hipponax was still being read um, so, um, 
Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think we certainly have to take that very much into account. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we we have a, a question from uh, from Adel Laerza uh, in the chat. Um, he writes, thank you very much. That was quite enlightening. I was wondering, in exploring coliambic verse, do you see any parallels or differences in how ancient poetic forms have been received and adapted in contemporary literature? Well... Oh, that's very interesting. I'm not actually sure, hundred percent sure I understand that question. Um, in contemporary literature, um, is it, 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 it still there? Perhaps we could ask. Yes. Hi. Can I say? Can I explain yes. that? Adiola, thank you. Yes, thank you. Could you could you explain a bit more? Yeah. Thank you for for the session. Um, so I was wondering, is there um some way in which um, there's some kind of revisiting of this um, polyambic verse in um in modern works. Are there um possibly contemporary writers or artists that are engaging with this in uh in a world as we have it today? Oh. My research my research is based on um how um forms from um antiquity have um um made their way into contemporary world. How are we engaging with them? And um, so I was wondering if there is some kind of um, um, line in this particular um, Coliambic verse and, um, and verse of that, yeah. Well, I don't well, know if you understand now. Yeah, I, well, I do. It's very interesting. I'm afraid you're, you're, you're really prodding my complete ignorance now. But I suppose, um, rather than naming names, I suppose my, my, uh, my first instinct would be to say, well, if, you know, given that whatever else it did, um, Coliambic verse always, you know, at some level represented a kind of break or rupture of a classical of a classical tradition. I mean, you know, there's always, um, you know, however high or whatever it is, it's always, you know, there's always this sense of there is something unexpected broken at the end of the verse. Uh, and uh, what is broken there, if you like, is, if you like, the classical, a classical verse form, then it would not at all surprise me if there were modern writers and indeed artists, too, who were, um, you know, drawing their effects from, if you like, establishing a, um, a classical mode a classical idiom, if you like, and then finding, you know, then finding a way of breaking at, uh, at the end. Um, now, I, I mean, I'm not, I can't myself particularly think of people, if you like, writing modern versions of coliams, but the, I mean, the principle would seem to be very applicable to um, aspects of the modern reception and reworking of the classics. So does that make any sense? It's not really an answer to your question. I apologize. Yeah, thank you. It's a line of thought. It's something to investigate and research, yeah. Thank you very much. Because, I mean, you know, when you, as I said, when you go back to, you know, that passage in that I mentioned in Demetrius about what Hipponax did, that he shattered the verse form, ethrause, by, you know, um, as it were, so that w whenever you come up against it in, in the Hipponactian tradition, you suddenly realize that this is a diversion uh, a per or indeed perversion of a classical model. And this, of course, is getting back to, to Peter's question. This is what a lot of people have been interested in more recently in Hipponax, things like the, you know, the Odyssean persona, or should we say the, you know, the inverted Odyssean persona, uh, and so on and so forth. So that uh the the you know so that the meter is seen to sit happily alongside that. Um, and I know that, um, you know, in, in his book about the Latin tradition, uh, Llewellyn Morgan has things to say about, you know, the use of um, Scadzone in Latin verse uh, along these lines. Um, mm. So, yes, no, I mean, uh, as I say, in, in principle, it sounds very, um, very plausible as an idea. Yes. Well, thank you, Adela. Uh, and... Uh... So we have another question from Peter Pickering, a uh, colleague from London, who who is asking about uh, about resolution uh, in this in 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 the in the in these uh, these later coliambic verses. Yeah. He asks, how much do these poets resolve feet? 
And is there anything we can deduce from their practice? That, well, I mean, it's obviously a very good question. I mean, the, I mean, the very brief and, as it were, unscientific answer is yes, resolution is practiced, but not not heavily so. Um, and uh, I don't, you know, in terms of the inscriptional and, if you like, non-literary colliams, it's very difficult to draw any conclusions from, um, in terms of chronology, for example, um, from resolution. Uh, but but we do find, I mean, just as with trimeters, I mean, you do find, um, you know, we do find resolution. Uh, but it's also the case, probably, that there is not sufficient material uh, in the, if you like, the non-Babrian tradition to draw any conclusions from that. But as you can see from the, uh, for example, from the Alexandrian epitaph, I mean, there is resolution there. Mm -hmm. There's also, I mean, for example, I mean, I didn't go into, I mean, I didn't go into this, but it, you can also see if you look closely at the the Alexandrian poem. There's not not only you know is there resolution, but there are, I mean, that you know, thing other technicalities like the treatment of um, you know short vowels before mute and liquid consonants actually varies in the course of the poem. But that too is that too, in fact, is perfectly regular for an inscriptional tradition. Mm. I mean, I, I didn't, I perhaps I, I could just add that, I mean, you know, again, in the interest of time, as I made it clear, I didn't in any way go through all of the poems we have. We have, there are a few more um, fairly brief um, coliambic um, epitaphs surviving from, um, from the imperial period. Um, and there's one from the island of Amorgos, um, where it's really very difficult to determine, you know, to say why this poem is in Coliams. Uh, there is, however, um, a poem, uh, an epitaph for a mime performer. Um, and uh, in, in that poem, you know, it's obviously tempting to think that, you know, if you that that there is something meaningful about mm. writing an epitaph for a mime. Uh, in coliams, I mean, I, I, I sorry, I left that poem out because it has, as far as I can see, nothing to do with Egypt. But, uh, mm. but yeah, but, mm. but I mean, as I said, I mean, I, um, uh, you know, I, I, I got interested, you know, I got interested in the subject simply because I, you know, I came across the, you know, I was, you know, I came across the this coliambic poem and just wondered how many others there were mm. and was struck by, you know, struck by really how few there are. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Susanna Moser is, says, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I was wondering perhaps naively about the relationship of such a limp meter and music. Can we expect that this sort of textual compositions were performed with musical accompaniment? Well, I think, uh, well, we'd lo love to know the answer. I mean, the, the standard answer, obviously, is that coliams like trimeters were not accompanied um, by music. On the other hand, um, we have, you know, it's it's very hard to believe, very hard for me to believe, I should say, that, you know, given the extraordinary rich performative, you know, we tend to think of, you know, trimeters because we sort of brought up in thinking about classical drama, we tend to think, well, trimeters, you know, are not accompanied by music, other meters are. But on the other hand, um, you know, it's very hard to believe that in the, you know, the very, very rich Hellenistic imperial performative traditions, people weren't, you know, doing that. Um, but we, as far as I'm aware, we know absolutely nothing about any, as it were, for example, any uh, musical or performative um, representation of coliambic verse, um, uh, in, you know, as being somehow funny at the end. I mean, when I say that, I mean, on the other hand, of course, you know, we do have, um, if you like, dramatizations of coliambic verse because, um, you know, the Lady Gillis in... Um, in her in, in Herodas's first mimiam is clearly a female embodiment of coliambic verse. Mm 
I mean, she's, you know, she's uh, 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 she's basically on the make trying to corrupt, um, you know, uh, uh, a faithful wife and she herself is lame um, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, she's, you know, just like Ovid represents, you know, elegy and tragedy. So Herodas gives us a woman who clearly is coliambic verse. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, there's no, you know, and so that was probably, I mean, that might well have been performed in in the sense of enacted, um, but we don't really know, we certainly don't know anything about any musical accompaniment that might have um, gone with it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just wanted to ask about the Ale the longer Alexandrian text that you that you yeah. talked about. Um I mean it's it's such an it's such an interesting an interesting text to put on a to put on a as an inscription I presume on a on a on a grave monument or yes yes it's on, it's on it's, a wall it's, on, it's yeah it's on a stele yes yeah yeah so it's on a grave stele but it, I mean it's it's so it's so long and so kind of you're right it, it's got a really strongly rhet rhetoricized yeah no it's very it's, to it. it's, yeah, it's 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 a remar it's a remarkable poem I think and it's um you know, it's obviously a pity that bit of it's lost, but you know, it's it's really quite it's very un you know in terms of in just simply of course in terms of length, it uh, it's it's very unusual. So uh, it and it, it ends after the consolatory myths, then. Well, it, it ends um, where it ends, but of course, many modern scholars have wanted to think that wasn't the end of the poem. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, because of, you know, because of the, the syntax, um, you know, because whereas we have all these repeated verses of didn't X weep, didn't Y weep, yeah. then we get, and also, you know, Alexander, whom Ammon bore, turning himself into a snake. Now, it's easy enough to supply a verb like didn't he weep, mm. but um, on the other hand, the rhetoric of the verse, and this is the, the way the argument goes, the rhetoric of the verses doesn't tell us why he Alexander wept. Yeah. So you either have to say, well, it must be a reference to something so familiar as to why, you know, to, uh, when Alexander lost somebody, or um, you say, well, no, there is something missing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, you know, striking again that there in this poem it ends with the story of Ammon, you know, turning into a snake and so forth, which also, to some extent, is the the story picked up at the beginning of the the A version of the Alexander romance. Yeah, the Nectanebo story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it, it just it 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 feels like a. It feels like a sort of liter it feels like a literary consolation rather than a rather yes, than a great well, epigram. Yes, no, it very much is yeah. a literary consolation yeah. in various ways, and and of course, consolation is is a very standard, um, you know, uh, for very standard on um, uh, uh, grave stones, grave epitaphs, mm. and epitaphic poetry, but certainly not to this length. No, yeah, yeah it's fascinating, fascinating piece. Uh, do we have any other questions or, or, or comments? Um, oh, uh, Liana Lomiento has written something in the chat for which we're very grateful. Uh, from these examples, it emerges that coliambic verse could be a flexible container, both of sculptic and eulogistic or even moral messages. So do you think it was possible that at a certain time, coliambic verse was somehow intended as a long verse, not too far from dactylic hexameters and other similar stichoi? was understood as a long verse yeah yeah. Um, In, yeah well i mean obviously liana liana is is, is very is correct um it does uh, it is uh, a uh, a capacious model and of course we know that in the hellenistic period already it was used both for um gnomic verse um and moralizing verse as well as the purposes for which Callimachus used it and of course the purposes for for which uh, Herodotus used it um I mean, it's interesting then, you know, get, this gets back to really what sort of, you know, I would most like to know is 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 how how the poem, how the verse felt. And I mean, one one, uh, you know, one direction that Liana's question would lead in is, 
um, are, is, are we sure that, you know, it was always somehow seen as connected to the iambic trimeter, or did it take on a life of its own, where it was, as in Liana's phrase, a capacious meter, which, like the elegiacs or the hexameters, which could be used for almost any kind of, um, um, I suppose, um, you know, I think that's extremely interesting. I suppose I, um, I slightly... You know, I still slightly feel that if that was the case, we might um, we might a have more of them, and it doesn't really explain the um, things like you know where I started, where Diogenes seems to treat coliams as you know a pretty rare kind of meter that he's very proud he can write. Um, you know, and it doesn't seem quite, you know, it doesn't seem quite like elegiacs or hexameters in that way. Uh, but on the other hand, I am sympathetic to, to the idea that we should be thinking, we should not necessarily always be trying to see it simply as a kind of diversion from the trimmers. Now, it might be that, you know, with the, the Alexandrian epitaph, Epitaphs in trimeters are, of course, very common, not, not of course, nearly as common as elegiacs, but they are very common. Um, and so there, I mean, I do think there's an element in, in the, the Alexandrian poem of, um, you know, this meter, it's not just that this meter is rare, but also it's marked off as different from higher than whatever um, uh, poems in trimeters. Of which you know, and you know, and if you go if you go through Benon's uh, collection, for example, there are quite a number of epitaphs there in trimeters that that are from you know from from the Greek cities of Egypt. Um, um, you know, some of them very you know there are some poems um, in Benon's collection which are very in some ways very Egyptianizing. You know, famous poems you know talking about mummification. Uh, and so forth, but they're in trimeters. And so clearly the coliams here are, you know, setting, I think they are again setting themselves up here against trimeters, but not in a not in a sort of, but clearly, obviously, clearly not in a um, you know, sort of uh any kind of aggressive way, um, but rather in a, as Liana said, in in a eulogistic kind of way. Mm -hmm. As, as a mark of poetic ambition. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liana. Yeah, well, it, 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 again, you know, it's just seems uh, you're going back to what you how you started your paper and basically saying that this is at this by by the by the late Hellenistic period at any rate this is a kind of versification that people could couldn't necessarily always hear, but. <laughs> Yes, that, and they, and that they could it, see. I mean, that's the thing. So it, it becomes it becomes a even distinguishing between a between yes, a tributary and a coliam yeah, becomes an, a difficult problem. Exactly, and of course, the you lady, have to be able to see that it's a coliam. Yeah, it will exactly. And as I said, you know, you know, you, you need to be able, and you know, unless they're flagged up, as you, <laughs> as you rightly say, you need to see that it's a coliam. Um, if anybody incidentally knows a great you know, trove of Byzantine coliums, which I have missed. <laughs> I would be very grateful for an email on the subject. Well then, on that note, uh, let's thank let's thank Richard very much for uh, for for a super paper and and a very uh, an interesting discussion. And uh, yes, so uh, we'll 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 come back uh in january with a with with a, with a whole series of of uh of talks through to through to through to june um so we're hoping we're hoping to 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 see you all there uh in the coming months but yes thank you very much richard it was oh, uh, well, thank very you. kind of you to be with us no thank you for the invitation much much enjoyed thank you